Well, good morning if you are in Los Angeles, California. Good afternoon if you're in New York. Good evening if you are in Europe, the UK, Warsaw, Poland perhaps. Uh, good overnight if you're out in the middle of uh, Russia and India, China and so forth. Japan, South America, Australia, New Zealand. We have listeners everywhere. And I'm Fred Plotkin. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays. And as you know, I welcome guests who inspire me. Some of them I know well, I've met personally. In the case of today's guest, John Rubenstein, I've never met him, but I have known his work for a very, very long time. I've been inspired by his work and that's really why he's here. Uh, he happens to have had a very famous father. We'll talk about him a bit too, but we're here primarily to talk about John Rubenstein, who joins us from Southern California. Welcome, John. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too, Fred. And yeah. hello to everybody. My gosh, just as to listening to you list the countries and the continents, I just, uh, I feel that we're all one. We've been battling this pandemic for so long in different ways and with different degrees of success. And, and uh, I just... Uh, wave my hand to everybody and hope you're healthy and well and surviving and figuring it out. What, what, a, what a strange year it's been. Huh? It has been, and while it has in many ways kept us apart in the personal sense, it globally in certain strange ways has brought us together. That's absolutely and right. People such as ourselves who, um, you are a very well-known actor and composer and conductor and orchestrator, you're a known quantity to people, but you and I didn't know each other at all, but very often walk the same streets in the same hallways in New York City. Uh, in my research to prepare for your visit today, I discovered we've worked at a lot of the same theaters and schools. So oh. I, I'm very glad to meet you um, finally. So John Rubenstein, you were born in Los Angeles in 1946. And your father was Arthur Rubinstein. And Arthur Rubinstein, I think most people agree, was one of the greatest pianists to have ever performed. And he had a very long, very productive life. And John, what I need to tell you right away is I grew up with Arthur Rubinstein in a different way from perhaps a lot of people who knew his performances and recordings. I knew them, but my father was a musician, he was a trombonist, and his favorite pianist was Arthur Rubinstein. And by his bedside were Arthur Rubinstein's two books of memoir, which I think I wrote them down, My Young Years and My Many Years. And my father, if he couldn't fall asleep, or if he wanted inspiration, would take out one of these books and read a chapter just to revisit some of the stories that Arthur Rubinstein told. So very often at table, dad would take out one of the books and say, listen to this, and he would read a story. Did Arthur Rubinstein tell you many, many stories all the time? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, he was, as you said, he was well known uh, for playing the piano. But a close second to that was his prowess <laughs> as a storyteller. He 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 was uh, he was a performer. He loved to to command an audience, and if it was just the family at dinner, or if it was you know just a, a, a big party, and he could corral five or ten people around him. He was always uh, the the center of attention. He he was a very sort of outgoing, uh, uh, effusive uh, man. People said, "Oh, Arthur, you should be an actor because he made faces and he imitated people and he did funny voices." And also, uh, you know, I mean, I was born when he was just about sixty years old, so my entire life with him was with him as a relatively older man. Um, so he had a lot of stories. 
he had been everywhere. He had met everybody. Uh, and he had done amazing things traveling the world all of his life. So he had great stories to tell that were true. And, and, and this was a big and because uh, I love to tell stories too. And I tell stories about my life so I can relate to that. But what he was able to do, which I know I can't do, is remember jokes, <laughs> long jokes that were stories, shaggy dog stories with funny punchlines. And he knew jokes and no matter what else was being talked about, he had an appropriate joke. Oh, that reminds me about the guy who, and he would tell these stories and do again, the voices and, and act out the parts and was hilarious. And so, uh, yeah, he was always the life of the party. And yet, I, I'm not a pianist. I studied clarinet and I studied voice. What always struck me about his music making was that all of that big grand personality, he would leave somewhere else when he sat at the piano, which is not to say that he was dull or didn't have personality at the piano, but somehow the focus, the intention as a man making music was much more humble. Is that a word I can use? Much more earnest, more to in service of the composer? You tell yeah. me what you think. Yes, that, that is absolutely true. And it was, um, I don't know what the word is. I was going to say inspiring, but that's a little bit cliche. It was, it was wonderful. It was great, especially to be his child and to be, you know, very, very close to him for many, many, many years. And to see that very phenomenon, because what I was just describing, his sort of very, very, you know, uh, outgoing uh, performative personality, which was very true. And he had a huge ego and he was, you know, he was very tough to deal with in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, he would do exactly what you said. He would leave that aside the moment he sat down at the piano. And that was true in the living room at home. And that was definitely true in the concert hall because he would, and it wasn't a, a, a sort of a, a religious type, here's what I'm going to do now, I'm going to focus. No, there was no effort in it at all. He could be just having finished some big story or yelling at me, why don't you this? And, and then boom, and he would sit down at the piano and everything he was doing at, from that moment on was about the piece, the composer, and the music, the phrasing, the, the, the sound on the piano, the, the fingers, the, you know, it was only about that. And I've known so many musicians, composers, actors, people who show up in public and <laughs> hawk their wares as, as I do. And I've very seldom met anybody who did that to that degree. The great pianists and, and you know, uh, instrumentalists that we all know and whose records we all listen to and we admire and who are amazing virtuosi and blah, 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 blah. Most of them, and I know them personally, a lot of them, most of them are there, they're doing their music, they're playing what they, you know, they're, they're showing their, beautiful talent, sharing it. But there's a lot of, watch me do this. See how softly I can do this pianissimo. Watch this amazing thing that I'm gonna do with this. And my dad, who was very, he loved, as I said, to be the center of attention and everybody to be paying attention to him. He didn't do that at all. He didn't do that at all. He. And he played very grandly and with tremendous yeah. power and presence, but it was always in service of the music to give it as a big gift to the audience. And that was a, that was a wonderful thing. And I, I believe that was along with his great talent, of course, that was the, uh, the reason for his big popularity and, and uh, success. 
I wonder if audiences today would perceive him in the same way where we are much more visual and we have, I think, not come to expect, but many people think that they are supposed to expect a certain showiness, a certain kind of overwroughtness. Um, I, I'm asked very, very often to appear on programs and give my opinions. And very often the question that comes at me is the same one, it's comparative, such as Maria Callas, Renata Tibaldi, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Vladimir Horowitz, Arthur Rubinstein, and you can go on, Luciano Pavarotti, Placido Domingo, you can go on and on and on and on and on. And I try not to be comparative that way hmm. because I think that with some of these people, we become invested in their personal dramas. Right. And we, we associate part of what they are doing in their performance with their personal dramas. So Vladimir Horowitz, Maria Callas, Billy Holiday inspire a certain audience that looks for the fragility, the drama, whereas other artists, we look to them for their security, Ella Fitzgerald, Luciano Pavarotti, Arthur Rubinstein, where they are, we sit down and we allow them to do their magic and don't wait for them to crack. Uh, I, when I worked at the Metropolitan Opera, we often, not often, but about five times had Vladimir Horowitz come and perform and he was often my responsibility. And I got along with him well enough, but he was used to, I'm gonna say this the way I mean it, used to being eccentric and being treated as an eccentric. And it was a defense mechanism against having to deal with certain people and certain things. Um, I've worked with all, I didn't work with Maria Callas and Tibaldi. I met Tibaldi, I heard Callas, but I knew Domingo and Pavarotti and Carreras very well. And they're all wonderful guys and they're all distinct. And I, I grew up in a Arthur Rubinstein, Arthur Rubinstein home, um, although Horowitz was very much admired. And when my dad would talk about comparative performances, he as a musician would approach it as a musician. Um, I wonder whether we have as much space now as an audience and as a, in terms of taste for people who are not showing off their fragility or their eccentricity, whatever you wanna call it. And that genius sometimes resides just in ability and not in fragility. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a hard one uh, to answer. I, I was, I was um, very honored a bunch of years ago. God, what year was that? Oh, I forget. I went to Moscow for the, for the uh, Tchaikovsky competition. Um, not the just last one, but the previous one. Was that 2011 or 12? Perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I was the, I was the guy who showed up online like this at the performances of all the competitors uh, to talk about them, to talk about the music, to, to be the, the, the MC basically for the audience because it was all live streamed. Um, and so I got to hear all of the uh, uh, pianists, young pianists mostly, who, who were competing uh, that year. Um, and uh, that syndrome that you're talking about, the, the, the kids, kids, the young musicians who were all brilliant pianists, all of them coming out of the, of the schools or just beginning their careers. Um, there was a sameness to their performing style, not obviously every single one of them, um, but there was that showy kind of thing, the leaning down and looking at their fingers while they were playing and, and the leaning back and the sort of, you know, acting is what I would call it, you know, uh, as though the music couldn't speak for itself or their playing of the music wasn't 
going to be enough for their audience. But I don't know if that was just each one of them personally just being that way, or if it was the schools around the world, the conservatories and the, you know, uh, the teachers uh, who were passing that on to them and they all just sort of as a group, as a worldwide group had sort of taken that on, or if it was some kind of <laughs> unspoken uh, pressure from audiences, where if you just come out and sit down at the piano and play, you're somehow not going to get the music or get the message across. I don't know, but I, it's definitely a syndrome nowadays among young people. But to ask, to answer your question, I actually believe that a person like my dad and like other uh, uh, pianists of his generation and of this generation, because I'm sure there are some as well who are more just, I don't know what the word is, just more together when they're, mm -hmm. when they're playing. Uh, that, that finally, it's, it's what you listen to, it's what you hear that makes the difference. And I very often listening to some of those pianists, I, I would, I would uh, close my eyes, I would stop watching so that I could listen to the music that they were making and not be distracted by the histrionics or whatever else was going on. Um, and most of us, even those of us who are very closely linked to classical music, like I was, or like you are as an actual performer, um, we do absorb a very big percentage, even now, and certainly back in the day, uh, of the music from recordings. Yes. So if we love an Arthur Rubinstein, we probably have been listening to his records a lot. And, you know, I mean, I went and saw him in concerts hundreds and hundreds of times, mm -hmm. but I was uh, lucky to be his kid. Most people, it wasn't, you know, oh, I heard your father three times, once in Carnegie Hall and once in, you know, Paris. And so one's impression of those kinds of, of musicians is much more about what we hear and how their music sounds rather than how they look when they are performing. So my question for you, having been the presenter commentator at the Moscow competition. First, as a musician, what was your reaction to their behavior? But secondly, and more importantly, as an actor, what was your reaction to the behavior? Because you as an actor summon <laughs> through your gifts and skills, emotions of a character based on literature, based on life experience and culture and everything that goes with one character or another. Whereas music is an abstraction. And when I've seen performers, whether it's a conductor or certain instrumentalists enact the music or shut their eyes as they're playing the violin and give the expression of being so transported, um, I'm not an actor, but I have always wondered what an actor would make of that and whether you as an actor, if you were portraying a musician, how you would, what choices you would make in terms of the, your acting performance. Well, um, I, I've portrayed musicians often. I mean, you know, uh, just by dint of being a musician myself and also people saying, oh, he's Arthur Rubenstein's son, he would know, you know, doesn't. <laughs> doesn't necessarily follow, but uh, um, I don't know. You know, with acting, it's, it, and with so many things, what matters the most, finally, is uh, truth. Um, we're struggling with truth in my country right now, sadly, and have been for some time. But uh, it's, <laughs> it's become a, a central element of our, of our history and of our political conversation. Who's telling the truth and who is lying? Didn't used to be, mm -hmm. even though we know that politicians lie 
that's part of the deal. But the lies weren't always the, the substance of, of their lives and of their political uh, agendas. That has changed. With acting, truth has always been at the center. Um, the actors that we most admire are ones who make us believe what they're saying, the situation they're in. Um, they can be very demonstrative about it as people are, as my father was, as even I am to some degree. I, I know that in my own acting, one of, the, one of my tasks now, and I've been acting professionally for, geez, 56 years. So I'm an old hand at it, but I still have to very often take down what you are seeing now, which is me. I make faces, I yell, I wave my hands around. I'm basically a, a, a child of my dad, you know. I, I, um, but when I'm playing Dr. So-and-so in some medical TV show, I gotta talk much more like this. This is how I am. I try to say, no, I think we have to operate because uh, she has a very severe cancer and we have to move it. That's pretty much what, what I have to do. And my early directors, when I was starting, I said, John, John, very good, very good, but uh, bring it all down. Otherwise it's not believable. It's not truthful. And watching all those young pianists in Moscow, yeah, every now and then, every now and then, not always, not constantly, I would say, oh, you know, why can't that person just play what the piece is? Just go diddly, diddly, diddly do. Why do they have to show me with such overt kind of acting what they are presumably feeling because the opposite is the effect. It makes me not believe that they are being truthful. Truthful yeah. would be just to play it. And yeah, emotion does register. My father was very emotional when he played and you could see it too. He would, you know, close his eyes sometimes. He would sh shake his head like that when playing a certain kind of a very forceful melody. And he would sort of straighten up and bug his eyes and bump, bada bump, bada bump, you know. And so you would see very, very uh, uh, sharply on his person, his face, his body language, the emotion of what he was playing, but he was never acting. He, that was just occurring to him. That, that was just how he was feeling. And I'm sure many of these younger pianists, the same is true. But every now and then you would find one or even one during a particular moment where you could tell they're not into it. They don't believe what they're playing this sentimental melody that they're playing, they don't really find it all that pretty, <laughs> but they have to play it. And so they're gonna sell it. Isn't this gorgeous? And it becomes phony. And so uh, that's, that's what it is. If you believe what they're doing, even if it's very outlandish, very demonstrative, that's fine, that's truthful, but it's the truth we're going for. And, and some musicians, and the, you can hear this on recordings too. I listen to them and I say, what in God's name is that person doing? You know, that's, you know, I don't want to use foul language on your show, but that's bull, that's, that's fake, that's not real. Oh, it's impressive. They hit all the notes mm -hmm. and I couldn't, so <laughs> more power to that, but, Mm -mm, I'm not convinced. My, my dad, dad was very convincing. My dad once when, I don't know, I failed at something, didn't do my best at something, pulled out a copy, a very well-worn copy of one of your father's books. And he read me a passage about making errors on notes when he was hitting a wrong note on the piano. And in effect, the punchline was, yes, but I played so many good notes too. <laughs> Well, I mean, 
<laughs> you know, which is a good attitude. <laughs> with my dad, that was the Achilles heel. Uh, and he wrote in those books and he spoke often about the fact that he had this tremendous talent. And when he was whatever, two or three years old, he was playing the pieces that his older sisters were learning and he were, was playing them by ear and in different keys. And I mean, so he had something going for him from the very beginning that most of us don't get. Um, and so he was able to get away with, and that was his phrase, I got away with murder, he would say. He used the pedal, he would play stuff very flashily, very musically, very intelligently, great ear, great sense of rhythm and time and, and panache. And all the notes weren't necessarily where they were supposed to be. And as he got older, and especially as he would always say, when he got married to my mother and suddenly said, "Uh oh, I got to shape up and be a responsible father and husband and citizen. He then started to practice. He was in his mid forties already and got way better. He was always able to play the pieces well. He now got so that he could play them much more accurately, but those 40 some odd years of basically getting away with it uh, cost him. And right through to the very, very end of his career, that was his bet noir, was his, that was his, uh, his thing. He would make mistakes and, and you know, uh, uh, my mother and my sisters and brother and I would go to his concerts and we, would, we wouldn't we would just lean back and relax and enjoy ourselves. We would sometimes hold hands and go, oh, here we go. And da -da 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 -da. here's the hard part because all day today, he was practicing it at home again and again and again. And he had about a, you know, a 300 batting average, which in baseball is terrific, but in classical music, not so much. 30%, uh, yeah. So he could always play all the pieces with all the notes, but not necessarily all the time. <laughs> and, and that was, you know, there were, there were nights where he would play beautifully. He would really, he would play the piece and it would be all there. And you could even argue that it, he played it better than some other pianist, if you were going to compare, which you don't. Um, but the other pianist played more of the actual written notes maybe mm -hmm. than he did. But again, I sat there in Moscow and I listened to all the all the great young pianists of today, or many of them. And I heard maybe over the three weeks and all day sessions of pianist after pianist after pianist after pianist, after pianist and the quarterfinals and the semifinals and the finals and with orchestra and solo. And I heard maybe three mistakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And when, um, and when somebody actually went blah, 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 and played the wrong note, the audience, you wouldn't make a noise because you were too polite, but there was this feeling of, oh my God, that wasn't, that wasn't correct. That was a mistake. And it raises- My father's day, that was, that was just- yeah. what But happened. it raises an important point about expectation. I, I knew Luciano very, very well. I worked with him a lot. We were friends for 29 years. And he famously undertook at La Scala in 1992, the very difficult role of Don Carlo by Verdi. It's one of the longest operas. It's a very tough role. And he, in the opening scene, cracked on a note. And La Scala, the audience, was, had the knives out already for him. And even though in the course of five hours, he didn't crack or miss any other notes and he sang magnificently, the debate was about the one note that he just doesn't have it if he cracked on that one note. And I remember he was very unhappy over that. And in the following performances, he didn't crack the note, but because of media then, social media now, all people talk about was Luciano cracking on that first note in the opening scene of Don Carlo. And I wonder whether our expectations are, are wrong. Uh, an actor can go up on his lines on a stage. I'll give you a very famous example that I witnessed. I'm a big lover of the plays of Ibsen. 
And I was in London and attended a performance of An Enemy of the People, which may be my favorite Ibsen play. Mine too. And I'm so glad to hear you say that. Dr. Stockman. And Ian McKellen, who was one of my very favorite actors, was playing Dr. Stockman. So I knew that I was in for a great night at the theater with a beloved play with a fantastic actor, except that he went up on his lines in the big scene in the second act where he defends um, everything that he defends about the public good and about the freedom of the media and about public health and everything that we were talking about in the past couple of years in the United States, except that the former president, when he would talk about an enemy of the people, framed the media as that. In this case, it's a medical doctor who's interested in public health. And isn't that realistic about our times now? But anyway, poor Ian McKellen could not remember the lines in his big speech. And most of the audience didn't know it because he brilliantly got through it by looking at one of the men in, in the crowd who was his understudy, his cover, who knew all the lines. Ah. And McKellen looked at him and said, well, what is it that we want to do? And the guy responded, well, we want to close the springs. Ah, and we want, to, we want to do this. And what else do we want to do? <laughs> so basically, the other actor did the speech until McKellen found his groove. And at the end of the performance, McKellen brought his understudy out and they took a bow together, which was- Oh, wonderful. that's great. Because, I mean, I guess 10% of the audience knew what was going on. That's and for uh, everyone amazing. else, it seemed like McKellen was, you know, inspiring the crowd like Spartacus. But, um, but I, something you, you were talking about inspired another thought in me. I coach opera singers a lot. And I coach them primarily in the interpretive aspects rather than musical production. And what I find with many young singers is that technically they're brilliant, they're gifted, they're well-trained but they don't feel their characters. They've not had the life experience yet to know what uh, Violetta goes through in Dying in La Traviata or um, what Alfredo, her beloved, experiences with the arrival of things like AIDS and other diseases in recent years. More people could witness that and experience it. But um, if, for example, in Pagliacci, you want to kill your wife because you think she's having an affair with someone else and you're an actor and it's a play within a play and so forth. Not many young tenors could muster that. And part of my job was always to instill in them the emotions without actually wanting to kill the woman he was singing with, but to understand where that comes from. Sure. And uh, to be blunt about it in terms of sexual issues, it's great nowadays, I think very great, that we're a lot more free and open about people's gender identity and fluidity and everything. It's all good as far as I'm concerned, but it doesn't help in playing roles from classical theater and classical opera where there were restrictions and hesitations or singing leader, romantic leader by, by Schubert or by Hugo Wolf where everything was about restraint and denial and absence of love or, or bleak future and so on. And I would love to know how you, either as an actor yourself or in working with other actors, awaken the possibilities of feeling and experiencing things you personally have not felt or experienced. Well, that's basically the... Uh... That's the, uh, the job. That's the job description of being an actor. Um, yeah, uh, I've obviously, as any actor has, have played many, 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 many roles uh, where the character I'm playing experiences, thinks, goes through something that I, John, have never come close to and hope never to. Mm -hmm or in some instances, wish I could. <laughs> but yeah, you what you do is you read. Uh, and, and great novelists, the, the, the Dostoevsky's and the Dickenses and the Faulkner's and the, you know, Steinbeck's, 
give you insight into the characters that they write. Um, and so starting from your youngest age, you know, of reading books. And I guess it's true too of watching movies and television. I mean, you do, you learn about people, you figure them out, but, but novelists write the words for you to, to, to glean what the character who says whatever he says, let's go. But you've read a page of description of what's going on inside his mind before he says those two words so that you you get what the subtext is you get what what is behind people's external either words or behaviors uh, and so as an actor that's what you do you know you 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 build in your in your mind the foundation of the person what they're going through whether it's immediately what they're going through in the room when this thing happens or they see this person or they hear this or what's happened to them over their lives, which brought them to this moment or both, mm -hmm. you sort of construct that inside you so that when you finally stand there and you have the line, let's go, you say it from that character's place, not from your own or not just emptily, because let's go. You can say that in about 800 different ways, depending on whether you're saying, let's go run from the tidal wave that's gonna swamp the house, or let's go, uh, let's jump into bed together, or let's go and get a hamburger, you know, I mean, and on and on. So you do that work, that's the actor's work. That is the actor's work learn your lines and figure out why you're saying them. Can that be taught or is it really something you either have or you don't have? Well, I mean, again, it's like, it's like with, a, with musicians. Can you teach a, a, a talented pianist to, to play something sincerely from his heart so that we, the audience, get that emotion and feel it with him? Can you teach that? Well. Yes and no. You can encourage it. You can, you know, you can uh, advocate it, uh, and you can maybe demonstrate it if you can play. But uh, you can't exactly teach how to do it. With acting, there are tremendous acting courses, acting teachers, acting schools. And they have all kinds of methods, including the method, which is famous. But basically, they are trying to bring you to a certain point past which you sort of got to run and, and score the touchdown by yourself. You've got to kick the ball into the goal. You know, mm -hmm. they can't do that. They, that can't really be taught. I teach, uh, I did teach, I haven't for the last couple of years. Um, at USC, you know, the, the University of Southern California, a class, as you are describing, of young singers, but not opera singers, musical theater, which is one step, I would say, apart from opera. Uh, I, I, I was going to say below, but I don't actually believe that to be so. I think apart is the perfect word. Yeah. Where the singing voice is extremely important but not as important as in opera. Um, but the acting is equally important to the singing, which is not always the case in opera. In opera, very often, it's almost a cliche, we are used to the great voice from whoever it is, and they can actually get away with standing there in their beautiful costume with a beautiful set behind them, and they can, and they can stare at the conductor the whole time. Their lover is here and they haven't seen them for 20 years and they can not even look at them and they can go, oh, I love you so much. And I have, oh, and you look so beautiful. And we're just counting with the conductor and producing our golden sound. And I've seen many operas like that and it's okay. 
we forgive them. We, the audience, fill in the, the emotion. Now, that's done much more rarely these days, but still it is done. And we see it and we forgive it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly when we get a Maria Callas or a, or a Leontine Price or somebody who walks on stage or a Cesare Sieppi, who was my hero when I was growing up, who walks on stage, has the amazing chops and is in the scene as much as they are singing the notes. Those are the great, you know, those are the great performers, the great singers, the great opera people. And in musical theater, it's the same. It's the same. What uh, I'd like to do just for a moment, I can do it or you can do it. Um, for our listeners who are in countries where they may not have the American musical theater, to define what that is, we call it the Broadway theater. I grew up in Manhattan, so for me, it's the theater. When I say the theater, I mean Broadway, although we have off-Broadway and wonderful small theaters around here. But I grew up near the theater district, and we would go to Broadway shows all the time. And a Broadway show was a musical show, often with a great score and a story that in some cases might have been very frivolous and light, but often like West Side Story, like Cabaret, consequential. And then there'd be shows such as Mame and Hello Dolly and Fiddler on the Roof that on the surface seemed a little light, but actually had a lot of depth to them as well. There would be tours de force such as Funny Girl for Barbara Streisand that they never quite have gotten back to New York on because it seems those shoes can't be filled the way Ethel Merman's shoes in Gypsy can be filled. And I'm just naming a few of the great shows, Guys and Dolls, and I'm waiting on Pippin because I want to talk to you about Pippin. But um, Broadway shows, Broadway performers are so-called triple threats that they can sing, dance, act, uh, be part of a large operation of, of scenery. They're knife throwing and acrobatics and all <laughs> kinds, I've seen it, <laughs> all kinds of things that can happen. Whereas in opera, we tend to, yes, they stand a little more, but the production values in opera are actually much bigger than Broadway. It's big on Broadway, it can be big, like a chandelier crashing in Phantom of the Opera, but that's operatic. In my youth going to Broadway shows, the singers did not use microphones. And I heard Ethel Merman and Carol Channing and Angela Lansbury and Georgia Brown and Joel Gray and many, many, many people do eight shows a week without microphones. Uh, I had, I know you did. I had a cousin, maybe you knew her, worked with her name, Alice Platon. Alice. Oh, sure. I never was, worked with her, but I knew her, yeah. The original, her name was Plotkin. The original cast of Gypsy, Oliver, and Hello, Dolly were her first three shows. I saw them all. Yeah, and Henry, Sweet Henry, and so forth. And Alice never had to be mic'd, and she was a tiny person, but she knew how to sing correctly, and she watched Merman in the Wings do Rose's turn eight times a week. She played Baby Louise. And... um then Channing and all these artists who could perform without mics. Nowadays, in my view, unfortunately, theater is mic'd, Broadway shows are mic'd in such a way that it's called sound design. But what it really is is amplification. And I've been to certain Broadway musicals in recent years that were so overbearingly loud that it, was, it bore no relation to hearing a performer on the stage and I go to fewer Broadway musicals because of that. Even when they do revivals of My Fair Lady, uh, they're amplified and I can hear the difference. So John, if you, we'll get to Pippin, but pick whatever play or musical you want, acted without amplification. How did you do that eight times a week and save your, your voice and your body? Well, again, you know, it's like anything else. Uh, you you learn, you you figure it out because you've got to show up and do it eight times a week. Um, I uh, started doing musical theater when I was a child, not professionally, but you know, in I went to schools in New York 
where they took uh, acting and performing seriously. It wasn't purely extracurricular sort of stuff to, to make the mom come to the school and go, oh, that's my kid. They actually trained us. Um, and they weren't professional schools. They were just normal, you know, private schools, but still. Um, so my first paying job was uh, in a musical uh, opposite Howard Keel, who yeah. was a great old Broadway star yeah. and, uh, and had a, a, an operatic voice. I don't think he ever sang opera in, at the Met or anything, but he could have, because he had one of those big old voices, which you sort of needed in, the, in those days because there were no mics. And all those big shows, the, the famous shows of Rodgers and Hammerstein and Jerome Kern and Cole Porter and George Gershwin, those were all done in Broadway theaters, which weren't quite as big as most opera houses. But still, you had to deliver your, your song over a pit of live musicians. Um, all the first musicals that I saw on Broadway were like that, of course. And um, my first experience of doing a show for a very long time was a seven month national tour called A Bus and Truck of a musical where I had to sing and, and act and, and we had no mics. Um, and you just, you train yourself to do that. You have to be able to. Some people have little tiny voices um, they were born with. Other people have big old voices, and I'm one of those, fortunately. But if I ever wanted to sing opera, for instance, I don't have that kind of a voice. I have a decent, semi-decent singing voice. I can carry a tune, and I can be loud, so I can get over an orchestra. When we, you said well, you want to talk about it later, but my first Broadway show was Pippin and I played the role of Pippin and I had a tremendous amount of singing to do, a lot of it very high. And although I can sing high, I'm not somebody you want to listen to singing high or low for that matter. <laughs> um, and we didn't have mics. We had four mics that lay flat on the stage floor, right in the front one, two, three, and four across the front of the stage. I don't even know what kind of mics those were. They were just there and they were about as long as my finger like that, you know? And every now and then we were blocked. We were choreographed to get near to one of those mics because it was a moment where the orchestra was, <clears throat> was louder than otherwise or something or it was a soft part where they wanted us to sing softer. And so we would not really get down because it was on the floor, but we would be near to that mic so that it would help us. But that was just the transition period. Pippin itself was a musical that was called a rock musical or something like that because it had slightly rock tempos in the music now and then. It wasn't a rock musical of any sort, yeah. but it, was called that. But part of the reason that it was, was that it had an electric piano next to the acoustic piano. It had an electric bass next to the stand-up bass. And it had uh, a synthesizer every now and then. The keyboard player would switch. And those instruments, and an electric guitar it had, you know. So those four instruments were played through amplifiers. They had to, because otherwise you couldn't hear them. So they were plugged in and they had an amplifier and you adjusted the volume on it and it played out into the house. As that became more and more the, the norm, electric, electronic instruments in the orchestra pit, they created a, a, a sound balance situation where a human voice, even a big operatic one, wasn't going to compete. You can't compete with a speaker, you know, 
you can compete with a violin and with an oboe and even with a trumpet because the conductor can say Shh, and all of that can be brought down and you can play so that your Carol Channing can be heard. And when it's loud, either she's 20 times louder or they sound loud, but they're actually playing sort of mezzo forte. They're not really giving everything they've got. That they'll give during the instrumental parts, the dance sections and the overtures. But when the person is singing, it's muted even during the big brassy parts that you hear on the recordings, they're playing mezzo. Once they introduced all those electronic instruments and all those amplifiers, the voices couldn't be heard. And it be you could scream, you could still be heard, but you, you the words couldn't be understood. And again, unlike opera, which repeats very, very often, you know, you'll say, adio, 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 adio. You know, you'll go on and on and on. We get it. Goodbye. <laughs> In musical theater, that isn't as often the case. You have complicated lyrics and they come quickly. The deadly deedly doodly doodly deedly deedly. And you got to get those things out there. Gilbert and Sullivan did it long before microphones. And the old Porter did it. What? Cole Porter did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the accompaniments were sort of. You know, and so the singer had all of the platform. Back in musical theater land, not so much. So it was necessary to start miking performers and so that they could be heard over the new orchestrations and the amplifiers in the pit. And that science has, as most sciences do, developed over the years. So that nowadays, it is rare that you go to a show and it's, as you said, too loud or off-putting. They've gotten it so that it, they really do a good job. They sit at the back of the house with these gigantic consoles full of things. And they, every actor is on a pot on a slider and they can adjust them they've got the band here the brass the strings the amplifiers they've got them all there and they listen in the room and control the sound they do it stereophonically now so that if you cross from one side of the stage to the other you don't hear it all out of the same one speaker so that you're never sure who's singing because the sound is all coming from one place. Now it comes from, so it's developed now so that it's really, really, really good. But I guess I would push back a bit and disagree with you in a friendly way because I sure. don't think it's really, really good. I think it's really, really <laughs> bad. Oh, it, it upsets me. And, and number one, because it goes back to a word that you use, truth. There's no truth in it. I don't know what kind of music making is actually happening because so much is being controlled on a soundboard. And then secondly, I'm just speaking of New York primarily, in our older theaters where you cannot superimpose certain kinds of technology, a theater like Studio 54 on 54th Street was a theater that a nightclub and now a theater again. And they put instrumentalists, not necessarily on the stage, and there's not always a pit, inside boxes and a conductor yeah. will be on one side and they're watching him or her on a, on a screen on the other side and the actor right. is seeing the screen from the stage and all the sound is being blended on a board in the back of the auditorium. And if I'm not dead center, if I'm house left, I hear, number one, I hear the conductor and the instrumentalist playing and then I hear the amplification of the sound a beat after the playing that I'm hearing live from above. And then I'm hearing the actors going with the amplified sound, not the original sound. To me, it's so disorienting, but not just that, the St. James Theater, which is a very large theater on 44th Street. I can't go to musicals there specifically because it's overwhelming in terms of the sound balance. And, and to me, the volume is too loud. On my smartphone, I've installed a uh, decibel meter. 
and occasionally I will activate it during a show. The ushers come over and say, don't make a call, don't make a phone call. I'm, I'm not, I'm checking the decibels. And it's so off the charts that number one, it's upsetting to my ears, but number two, it's not healthy. But number two, it's not good performances. And I think we as a society have lost track of the sensitivity of volume. And whether in our eating spaces and a lot of our uh, mass transit and our public spaces, everything is too loud. No, I agree with that. I absolutely do. You know, uh, I, I think it has to do with recordings, with the rise of rock music, which in and of itself is loud almost always. The drums are playing very, very loud. All those amplified guitars and basses and so forth. The experience of going to a rock concert is one of going deaf. I mean, that's part of the deal. And so when you grow up with that, which us old people didn't, we grew up in a, a, an acoustic time. But if from day one, all you hear, and most people hear pop music and rock music much more than they hear theater music or opera or classical music. You get used to a sort of a, a decibel that is way higher than anything that you and I were used to or, or, or want. And so we listen to records, we hear those voices screaming at us. Then when we go to the theater, if that voice is sort of far away and there's a lot of music between us and the voice, we don't like it. We can't follow it. So we've amplified the voices to match the amplification of the music. And, and you're absolutely right. All of the volume has gone up and it's not always handled well and it's unpleasant. I had an experience four years ago, I guess, or five years ago that to me was so instructive. We know that Barbara Streisand is a perfectionist and she came home to Brooklyn where she was born and Brooklyn has a theater, not a theater, a stadium called the Barclays Center that is where the basketball team and the hockey team plays and they have big rock concerts. Right. And Barbara Streisand being a Brooklyn, I sold the place out in seconds and I believe it's 19,000 seats. And I noticed, and I was sitting way up and far from the stage and she was using amplification. I took out my decibel meter every so often. She never, and the band never went above 70, which is good normal hearing and the maximum that you would want. Whereas just about every other act I've heard in the Barclays Center, I heard Bruce Springsteen in Madison Square Garden. He's a fantastic performer, but it was way too loud. And Streisand by insisting on it, I heard Charles Aznavour, for example, magnificent singer from the pre-microphone era, but it was too loud and it didn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Streisand, by never going above 70, it was the most beautiful performance because everything was harmonious and harmonic. And I can only imagine that because she's such a, a stickler on these things, that she insisted it be so. And it made a world of difference and proved to me that it can be done in modern times and no one complained they couldn't hear the concert. It was just in the right volume level. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't know. When I, when I sing in the theater, I sing as though there were no mic. I'm wearing a mic. It's usually one of those things that you, now they allow them to be visible. They used to try to hide them in, the in wig. your hair or in your yeah. beard. I did um, uh, ragtime and I didn't have a beard then, but they would glue a big beard on me mm -hmm. and then they would string the mic through the beard so that the tube, I would have two mics in my beard hair, which you barely couldn't see, but they were right here. Uh, but I would always and still do sing at full volume as though there were no mic. And the sound guys who sit in the back always thank me. And they say, in, not because I sing well, but because I sing loud. And they would say, thank you, because when you're singing, we don't need to boost you very much. We do so that it matches. Because if they took you out, you would suddenly 
seem like you were 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. But many singers now, even very, very renowned and wonderful musician type singers in the uh, musical theater, relax because they know they're mic'd right there on their cheeks. They don't have to produce that sound. They don't have to use that diaphragm and give it. They can, and those guys in the back can boost them up and you can hear them very, very well. And they don't tire out their voices. And that's lazy and to me, not very satisfying. But um, Streisand certainly gave everything she had so that the sound guys didn't have to boost her, so that the overall sound didn't need to rise so high. And maybe Osnivore was very conversational. He also was past 90 when I saw him, and he was oh, wonderful. Well. Wonderful so he, on the stage. He probably was singing pretty softly by then. But he he had it, whatever it was, he certainly had it. But yeah, I was angry at the sound crew, not with him. Um, let's go to Pippin. Um, I think every audience member has his or her show that awakens something in them. And I had been going to Broadway shows since I was three. The first one I saw was Gypsy with Merman and Cousin Alice. And I went to everything Alice was in, but also Man of La Mancha and Fiddler on the Roof and Funny Girl and Mame and Cabaret. And the only one I was not taken to was Hair because it was nudity or there was reported to be nudity. Um, but the the musicals I saw until I saw Pippin were all wonderful and I could sing all the music, certainly Fiddler on the Roof and a few of the others. I knew every note, but the two that really just grabbed me and changed me were very close to one another. They were Stephen Sondheim's Follies the year before, I think, Pippin, and then Pippin. And I need to tell you for background that I was already working in opera and planning to be in opera and therefore was a student of Renaissance history. And the story <laughs> of Pepin and Charlemagne and, and Charlemagne is mentioned in the opera Don Carlo. I had to study European history to be prepared to work in opera the way you would read Dostoevsky. I would study wars and battles and and social mores of different eras. So if I wanted to work on Rigoletto, I could understand Mantua 1485. And if I wanted to do Traviata, it would be uh, Paris in the 1850s and so forth. And here was a show that had very appealing music about a young man figuring his way out. I was 16. Um, who am I in the world and what will I be and what will I stand for? Uh, it was staged brilliantly by Bob Fosse with great choreography and staging like I'd never seen before. Um, it had a leading player who was not the title character, but he was, that was played by Ben Vereen. And he was sort of a narrator and an outsider and I would come to figure out in about six months after seeing the show that it was very much in the style of Bertolt Brecht. And that I didn't grasp on first thing, and I came to see it a few times. Um, it had a very talented cast of performers I mostly didn't know, except for Irene Ryan, who was in it initially, uh, who played Granny on a TV show called The Beverly Hillbillies, but she had a certain vaudeville old showbiz pizzazz that was brought out in this, but it had a young actress in Jill Clayburgh who went on to a lot of fame. Leland Palmer, Eric Berry was established and Ben Vereen and John Rubenstein. And I, having grown up with the books of Arthur Rubenstein, didn't know that you were related. So I didn't bring that to your performance at all. It was your performance and I, at the same time, I, I studied with Leonard Bernstein and one of the shows that I knew very well, shows operas, was Candide. And to me, this the show Pippin was Candide. Very Old much. Prevails yeah. the young 
innocent, aspiring character who has his many setbacks and is confused by women and, and confused by politics and everything around him. To me, it was Candide without the heavy weight of 1950s American politics that Candide brought with it. And so I was completely taken with the show and I could, and probably still could, recite all the lyrics to all the songs. Wow. And it, it just, it's one of those works of art and we all have it in our lives that gets you at the right moment and informs your path and, and the rest of your life. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna start quoting the lyrics to you, but there's a song called Corner of the Sky. Um, and it's about who I am and where I belong. And you would sing it in what I now come to understand is a higher voice than your, your probably natural range. <laughs> but with such an emphasis on the words and their meaning in the words, that for me, it was theater as much as musical theater. And that was a big part of that show as Follies was the year before. And I think that I reached a point in my life where a great Broadway show like Funny Girl was terrific for the performer, but when musical theater was also theater. I had not seen West Side Story. I was too young for that. That's musical theater. Uh, there are many, Fiddler on the Roof, I suppose, could be called musical theater in its way. And many shows that have followed. But how old were you when you did that? Uh, 25. And how did they find you? How did it happen that you wound up in that show? And then I want to ask you how you experienced the character. Well, that's a long story. I'll, I'll sort of we're cut here. it short. <laughs> I had done a movie. Um, well, first of all, I, uh, I auditioned my very first Broadway audition, because I went to college. I grew up in New York, but I came out here to LA to go to college, to go to UCLA. So I was still at UCLA, uh, but I would go back to New York because my parents were still there and I would you know, go back several times a year and I would see as many Broadway shows as I could mm -hmm. each time. Um, and so I had seen Cabaret and loved it. Mm -hmm. um, and a friend of mine found out that Joel Gray was going to leave it. He played the MC as he did in the movie and he was amazing in it and he won a Tony award and everybody was very excited about him. And I was too, having seen him. And I listened to the record a million times. So he got me, this friend of mine got me an audition uh, to take over for him when he was about to leave. And I was 19, hmm. flew to New York, got an appointment it's that's a funny story which i won't bore you with how i got that because i shouldn't have but i found myself there on the stage of the imperial theater uh singing welcome and bienvenue for uh hal prince and his people and um then he had me come back two days later he said but put the makeup on get the makeup so i got the white face makeup and the little lipstick and all the stuff that Joel Gray wore. And I came back and did this, the number again with that. But I didn't get a costume. And I was 19 and very skinny. And I just, you know, I looked like I was 15. So I came back to LA because I was still in school and I got a letter from Hal Prince, Harold Prince, who died last year. Great director, producer uh, of Broadway shows forever. And he wrote me a letter uh, saying, you were the best person who auditioned, but there's no way I can give you that part because you're just too young. And that character has to have been around the block a few times. Mm -hmm. He couldn't be 15 or 16 years old. Okay, I was disappointed, but I didn't expect to be cast. And I was greatly encouraged. So cut to many years later, I'm now an actor and I'm, I've done musicals and stuff out here and a lot of TV and a few movies. Um, and uh, they're making the movie of Cabaret. 
And I played the lead in a movie that the same production company uh, made, ABC Pictures. They made two movies, one called Zachariah that I was in, um, which was a big flop, but it hadn't come out yet, <laughs> uh, and Cabaret. So when I heard that they were making Cabaret and I was the star of their other movie, which was still not released, I went to the head of the company and I said, hey, I want to play the MC in Cabaret. And he said, we got Joel Gray. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So that was the end of that. Now, nine months later, no, a few months later, he calls me at home and says, hey, John, can you do an English accent? I said, yeah, yeah. I went to a British school in New York. I can do English as though it were, you know, me. Come and meet Bob Fosse, he said, because Fosse has Michael York playing the male lead in Cabaret, but Michael has scheduling problems and he won't be able to do it. It looks like we, we need to find this guy. Okay, I meet Bob. He's very nice. We get along. I do a screen test, old fashioned screen test. This is before video um, for that part. And I think that Bob probably would have cast me. But Michael York fixed his schedule and he did the movie of Cabaret. End of story. Now it's nine or 10 months later. My phone rings at home here in LA. My wife is eight and a half months pregnant. It's Bob Fosse. He said, oh, hi, yeah. John, can you sing? And I said, um, yeah, you are, sort of, not really. Can I come over? I said, yeah, sure. He came to my house. My wife made dinner. I sat down at the piano and played and sang two songs by Laura Nero. Now, she was my Marvelous singer, yeah. huge inspiration as a composer, as a not classical pianist, and as a singer. Uh, I loved Laura Nero. And so I knew all her songs and played them and sang them. So I sang two Laura Nero songs for Bob. And then he brought the script of Pippin and we sat down on the couch and he read all the parts and I read Pippin and we read through the whole play. We had dinner and he left. And now my wife and I went to bed because she was really pregnant and we went to bed sort of early, but it was about around 11 o'clock. And our bedroom door was the first door you came to because we lived in the hills and the living room and everything else was upstairs. So we're going to bed and bang, there's a knock at the door at around 11. We have the lights out. I go, I open the door. Who is it? It's Bob Fosse. Mm -hmm. And he has a tape cassette tape in his hand. He says, learn the second song and come to New York in three days. Wow. The second song was Corner of the Sky because the first song was Magic to Do, the opening number. The tape was Stephen Schwartz, the composer, playing and singing all of the songs in Pippin. Um, I flew to New York three days later. I learned that song off the tape. I have no music. Um, Went to the theater. There was Stephen Schwartz and Bob and the producer, Stu Ostro, and the writer, Roger Hersant. And I went down into the orchestra pit to the piano there and played my two Laura Nero songs singing up <laughs> to the guys who were all leaning down into the pit because I had no sheet music for those songs. And then I got up onto the stage and sang Corner of the Sky with their accompanist playing. And um, about, I don't know, three minutes, they talked amongst themselves in the house. And then Bob ran down the aisle and came up and to the stage and said, the part's yours if you want it. Wow. And that's how I got that part. And then your wife had the baby house soon after? About two weeks. So you were home in LA and then you oh, went I back? Oh, I flew home that, that afternoon. Okay. And, so... Uh, now I'm getting very geeky, which is not a word I ever use about myself, but I just realized that I have to do it. Um, as someone 
studying medieval and Renaissance history, <laughs> to hear you sing a lyric such as, and it comes to my mind immediately, um, the moat won't stop leaking and the goat won't stop shrieking and the griffin keeps losing its hair. The west wing is rotting, our best wine is clotting. I'm terribly sorry, but I don't care. Yeah. I have to be someone who lives all of his life in superlatives. When wow. you're extraordinary, you think about extraordinary things. That was gospel to me at the time. Wow. And I'm sure that most kids and even most adults didn't know what griffins were and moats and goats. I mean, goats they knew, but not in that context. But what it really to me was like the window into opera about these characters who have to be something more than what they're told they can be and they were surrounded by war and charlemagne the great and armies and i had was informed by candide and i didn't know where all that was coming from but you became the incarnation your character became the incarnation of so much that I was grappling with that frankly, most kids were not, not in terms of the existential part, but very specifically history and our connection to it and our awareness of it. I had not yet been to Europe, although I would go the following year. And that show and the lyrics and the questioning so pointed me toward places that I felt I had to go anyway. I wonder, yeah. I mean, because I must say, in my long years since that show, that was what, almost 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, next year it'll be the 50th anniversary of, of opening. Um, you are the first human who has ever quoted that <laughs> particular song to me um, so accurately. And who has talked about Pippin as having anything to do with history. Um, they talk about it as the everyman character. Candide comes up occasionally, you know, the leading player, the devil figure, the Faust idea, you know, but in terms of inspiring you in a historical way. So that really makes me happy just to hear you talk about it from that angle, which I've never heard before. And that inspired you to, you know, to pursue it and go on into Europe and all that. That's wonderful. That, Praise that be to Charles, so our Lord triumphant is his sword. I, I mean, throw me any, any song from that show and I can recite it practically, because, but it was not about, it was not about the music, although it was very fine music. It was really about, reading and hearing a text in 1972 when I was 16 that addressed issues that I was thinking about, but in, a, in my world, which was the world of opera and history and art and so on. So seeing a Broadway musical set, the 13 or 1400s was not typical. Camelot somehow didn't do it for me at all. I don't know why, but this one absolutely did. Um, see, I had always had a passion for vaudeville and vaudeville performers and seeing Irene Ryan that oh, year, course. two the year before was no, no, Nanette, the revival with Ruby Keeler and Pat. Well, there Kelly. was also right at the same time, uh, there was a Candide revival. Yes. Did you see uh, that one? I did see it, of course. That, and they re redid the Broadway theater. The yeah. Yeah. But um, seeing Irene Ryan, who Americans know her as Granny of the Beverly Hillbillies, but she didn't channel that at all. She channeled vaudeville right. and brought down the house every night with her one number, Time to Start Living. And even that, as an old lady, she was not that old. She was 70, but the character was an old lady who had seen it all and done it all. And she was... Um, she was turning to this young man and inspiring him that's time to start living, time to take a little from the world we're giving and on and on and on, you are my time. Give me a night that's romantic and long. Give me a, a, man, a, stalwart, a man who's stalwart and steady. Give me a night that's romantic and long. Give me a month to get ready. Maybe it's meant the hours I've spent feeling broken, bent and unwell and so on. It's as if it had been written for me. 
Wow. And um, to see that kind of vaudeville performance. And then I've seen many other women play the role, but Irene Ryan really captured the spirit of that number. Did you, what was your interaction with her? Well, I mean, it was, it was what you saw, you know, mm. I also had watched pretty much every episode of the Beverly Hillbillies. So she was granny to me as she was to America and probably some of the world. I don't know to what degree those shows went out in those days. Um, and so, yeah, first day of rehearsal, it was like, oh my God, it's Irene Ryan, you know, but then I had that short, basically scene with her. I run on stage. I talk to her. She says a few jokes to me and then she does her number. And I just sort of sit there on the side and watch her do the number. And then she gets carried off and I don't see her again for the whole evening. So uh, I didn't have that close of a relationship with her. Although, you know, I did the show with her for almost six months yeah. and you get to know people, you know, you hang out a little bit especially when we were uh, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. at the uh, Kennedy Center Opera House, which was where we first opened the show and played it there for a month before we brought it to Broadway. So we hung out much more then because right. we were rehearsing all day and doing the show eight times. So we would go out to dinner together. We were all living in a hotel similar to each other and close. And so the moment you hit New York and start doing the show eight times a week, it's a job. And everybody goes home the moment it's over and you don't see each other very much unless you really make an effort. And but then she left heard, suddenly yeah. and yes. died, you know. Yeah, she uh, got ill. She had a brain yeah. tumor. Yeah. Um, but it must be a burden for certain performers to be so identified with a role such as Yul Brynner in The King and I and maybe Irene Ryan as Granny that they always have to live independent of that but what struck me so much about her performance is that I didn't see Granny, the character from the Beverly Hillbillies, in no, her. No, because she didn't play anything like that at all. Right, and right. that that was very much a lesson for me because my only experience of Irene Ryan was this <laughs> over the top, very funny, benighted but um, tough as nails, and and also slightly sympathetic character on the Beverly Hillbillies, which was a charming but ridiculous show. She herself, you know, uh, that was one of the first things that I saw and noticed about her, yeah. was very distinguished. Yeah. You, you would never think of her as granny from the Hillbillies. Um, not only did she not have that kind of accent and that kind of behavior, but she was kind of the person that you would expect to go to the opera and to to be very distinguished and drink tea out of a little cup. That's how she actually was in life. So playing the, the mother of, you know, of Charlemagne and, and the grandmother of this Pippin was more in her real character than Granny from the Hillbillies was. And she struck me to some degree as being a certain kind of Shakespearean mo elderly mother who was wise yeah, the kind of character Vanessa Redgrave and Judy Dench play now, basically. Right. <laughs> uh, smaller roles, but bearing all the wisdom of their age. Um, I'm just going to say thank you for Pippin, and then I want to go on to a different play, a play this time that struck me at least as much as Pippin, but for all kinds of other reasons, namely Mark Medoff's Children of a Lesser God which was done eight years after Pippin, I believe, uh, around 1980. Yeah, and I was just enough older. I was just finishing graduate school and embarking officially in my career, although I worked in the arts before, but officially I was going out in the world. And it's a story of a teacher, James Leeds was your character, who works with a deaf woman named Sarah Norman, who was played by Phyllis, Phyllis Freilich, who in life was deaf and she was North Dakota. Her parents were deaf. She was one of nine kids. They were all deaf. And in real life, yeah. In real I'm, life, I mean, yeah. 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 And so an entirely other reality and world, a world of silence. And your character, who was a speaker, but also a, used American sign language, a signer, um, 
learned a lot from this deaf character about the assumptions that we, with all of our senses, assume that we are better equipped or gifted or whatever with our hearing. And yet her character, who was could not hear technically, was also very much the listener. And her responses to you, to the situations, without words, were a huge lesson about humility to me and about who we are as people. And you so deftly, oh, that was not a, meant to be a pun. De, I'm sorry, I really, that was not meant to be a pun. That was a compliment. D-E-F-T, deftly, you so ably walk that fine line between representing we the hearers and being the the navigator into the world of deaf people and while i guess her character in a way was the more dramatic character you won a tony award which is the highest honor in the american theater as best actor for your role which was a very difficult role um how did you prepare for that? I mean, I should add one more thing. My coming from the spoken and musical world to enter the world of the non-hearing challenged all kinds of assumptions about our gifts and abilities with our five senses and what the senses mean. And that show alerted me forever after about all of our senses. There's a, uh, an interesting little side story to that. Um, <clears throat> we did the show originally here in Los Angeles at the Mark Taper Forum down at the Music Center. <laughs> and there was actually one night where my dad was playing a concert at the Dorothy <laughs> Chandler and I was doing Children of a Lesser God <laughs> at, the, uh, at the Mark Taper. And that was cool. And we had dinner <laughs> together afterwards after our two shows. That was, that was a wonderful little moment in my life. But anyway, uh, we did it here. Uh, we, it was written and, and rehearsed and you know rewritten during rehearsals and so forth. Got very, very good reviews. And, it, and the taper, which is almost round, but not quite. Uh, it's sort of like the Vivian Beaumont in New York, but better. And it, um, it, the, the play had a beautiful, it just worked so beautifully there. A friend of mine came to see it, as many of my friends did who live out here. And he happened to be the director of that movie, Zachariah, that I told you about earlier, that was the big flop before Cabaret. George England, wonderful fellow. He died last year, uh, a couple of years ago. And anyway, um, he came and saw it and we went out and had dinner afterwards. And I don't know if you remember in the show, there, there's a scene where my character is listening to music and she, the wife, is bored and sort of, you know, wanting me to, st I'm, I'm sitting with earphones on, raptured listening, and she's like, come on, you know, let's talk, let's do something. And, and I try to explain to her what music is. That scene wasn't in the play in Los yeah. Angeles. And my friend George uh, took me out to dinner afterwards. And he said, you know, I really like the play. And he said, some of the kind of things you were saying about deafness and about communication and about the hearing world and our senses and all of that stuff, because that's what the play was so much about. But he said, he said, I missed a moment about music. Because for us hearing people, sure, talking and communication is the number one thing we do with our ears. We listen and we talk. And to communicate with sign language to somebody who can't hear, that's huge. But music is something that we hearing people enjoy. And our lives are affected so deeply by it, whatever kind of music or kinds of music we love and we listen to. Um, and that is something that deaf people do not 
and cannot share, no matter how communicative they can be. And they, they do put their hands on things and feel vibrations, but it's still not the same, you know, the vibrations from a Brahms symphony and the vibrations from, you know, Bruce Springsteen are, you can't really quite, you know, and he said, there should be something in this play because we get so moved, we, the hearing, mostly audience, uh, about the whole topic and the whole idea, but music is never mentioned. So I went back when we were then, now we're moving to Broadway and we re-rehearsed, you know, uh, in New York, um, slightly different cast, but most of us were the same. And I went right to the playwright and I said, what I just said. And he said, wow, okay. Well, he said, why don't you write a speech for your character about music? I said, well, I'm not a playwright. I, he said, I don't know, I'll, I'll write it, but you give me some ideas. So I did, I wrote a long speech about me, John, as a, person of music, no matter what else I was, I was a musical person, grown up in music, trying to communicate to somebody who never has heard anything, what music is, not just what it means to me, but what it in fact consists of. And I wrote that speech and he didn't change it much, I say self-aggrandizingly. Um, and to me, that was one of the most moving moments in the play because yeah, you can solve communication with deaf people and they can communicate to you from a completely different place. And that is a beautiful thing. But music is something else. And, and this character fails in that scene to communicate because he pours his heart into it. He tries to talk to her about trombones and about this and about that. And, uh, and she finally is sort of, I don't know, anyway. And they move on to something else, you know? Um, How did Phyllis Freilich, the actress who played Sarah, feel about this edition? And she liked it. Mm -hmm. She liked it because, you know, she listened to music by feeling vibrations. And, and that is something that I don't relate to very much because to me, music is so much more than just the, brrr, the vibration of it. But to a deaf person, it probably has all kinds of subtleties and gradations and things that we hearing people don't, you know, we don't even notice or, or, or pay any attention to. So no, she, she liked it very much and it was, and I, I, they, I, I picked the music that we played, uh. which was the double concerto by Bach, yes, played by Pinka Zuckerman and and Itzhak Perlman. Perlman, yeah. And we played that, and the audience sat there in the Broadway house and listened to that second movement, Dee, da, 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 you know, along with my character listening to it, and then watching Phyllis say, "What's going on?" You know. Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening in this room. You, know? you reminded me of something I had forgotten about for a long time. When I worked at the Metropolitan Opera, some of my years there were as performance manager. That's the person who ran operations in the theater every night during performances. And I came to know many of our regular members of the audience. And one of them was a very nice woman who was completely blind, good hearing, excellent hearing, but completely blind who was very wealthy and could afford to sit in any seat in the house. And she had beautiful guide dogs, old succession of dogs through the years, and would often come with a friend in addition to her dog who would help her. And she knew the stories to the operas, but couldn't obviously see anything. And she always would sit in the first three rows on the aisle so the dog could get out. And those were very expensive seats. And I once said to her, you know, you don't have to, I can arrange for you to sit further back so you can get in and out of the theater more easily and the dog, if it has to, can get out more easily. And she said, no, 
I want to sit very close to the stage. I take my shoes off. I hope you don't mind. And I plant my feet on the floor and I feel the vibrations of the singers. I know Pavarotti on my face, different from Birgit Nielsen or Joan Sutherland on my face by the sensations I feel in my face. And I would only get that if I sat very close. So I, I envision who they are and what they're doing. I know that Pavarotti is fat, but I don't know anything else about him. I don't know the color of his hair. And she said, in my mind, I create imagery of all of these singers in part based on the vibrations I'm getting in my face and what I'm getting in my feet on the floor. So wow. of course <laughs> she can stay there. But I coined a term, John, a few years ago that I used to describe about myself that flummoxes certain people when I say it, but I think you'll get the spirit of it. A pleasure activist. And by pleasure activist, I don't mean that I do illicit things for my services, but rather that I'm a big believer in the activation of our five senses and using them, understanding them and using them to our very fullest so that we listen, we just don't hear, we savor, we just don't put food in our mouth. We can distinguish smells and have memories connected to smells and all those things. Touch is very valuable. And frankly, in the pandemic era, if you are not living with a significant other, touch is being deprived in this era. And it's a very notable thing when I talk to other people about what they miss. One of the things they miss is touch. Yeah. And so I teach pleasure activism. And I teach the activation of the senses because I believe too, that if we fully use our senses, it makes us better actors, better writers, better singers, better doctors, better everything that we have to do to use our senses. And these five senses feed the sixth sense, which is intuition, memory. How do we know something? How do we experience something? How did I learn all the lyrics to the entire show of Pippin? It's not just memory. It was a connection to something. Yep. And so this awareness of the senses really happened around the time that I saw Children of a Lesser God. I, I knew them before, but it activated my, my sensitivity to the absence or the presence of senses and how we use them and how the absence of one doesn't mean that we're less sensitive. It means that we're more sensitive in other ways. And this is what great theater can do. And it, you know, I wish, I, I saw you in many, many other things you did here in New York, always with pleasure, but I know that you also have an acting life outside of New York City. And I wish that I could have seen more of those performances because I began this conversation by saying that I invite people who inspire me. I think now you understand how, I hope so. <laughs> I must say, yeah, I'm very, very uh, surprised and touched yeah. that, that, uh, that, that you were there with me during those times uh, because it's all about the audience. That's, that's what we're doing. You know, we're hoping to give the people who, who come and, and buy their tickets something to take home with them. I know that I grew up in that city seeing virtually every play and musical that ever opened um, uh, because it was affordable. Yeah, in those that's days. Thing. Yeah. On my allowance, I was able to go to Broadway shows, which now would be impossible for me or for any kid, you know? Yeah. Uh, which is really a cr crime. It's a shame. But anyway, that's life. Um, but what all of those shows, I'm just like you, you know, I, I, the shows that I saw, I remember going innocently without really knowing anything about it because I would almost automatically get a ticket, see a show not always knowing who the writers were, the actors, I didn't read everything about it. And I've stumbled into Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Yeah. You know, with Uta Hagen and Arthur Hill and Arthur Hill, uh, yeah. George Grizzard. And that was, it, it, it wasn't as, as 
uplifting as <laughs> maybe a Pippin or a Children of a Lesser God might have been, but it was it was eye opening. It was revelatory about the human condition and about what relationships can be and what people go through and the people that we see from a distance, university teachers whom we tend to revere. look up to and revere. Yeah. Maybe when they go home, they have these dark, weird lives, you know. Um, anyway, I, I just remember stumbling out onto the street and rethinking so many things about my own life and, you know, uh, and so many plays and musicals like that, 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 that live with me in my heart uh, today and always have. So it's wonderful to hear that, that, um, that you had that experience, even sure. with some of the stuff that, that I was involved with. So it, well, it, but it, also it, in that whole era, as you said, economically, it was possible. I didn't have money, mm -hmm. but as a kid at $3, I could go and sit in the back row of a theater and see Colleen Dewhurst did everything. And Colleen Dewhurst, who is not well remembered now because she was primarily a stage actress, was just the greatest actor, actress on the stage, in my view. There were many, many, many other fine ones, and I saw them all, but there was just something about Colleen Dewhurst that particularly grabbed me. She was beautiful, she was earthy, she was vulnerable, she could play the entire range of an emotional arc of a character with a great voice. And, but she was not vulnerable in the way that certain women characters were written to be vulnerable. She was strong. And I saw her play the, the Greek version of Electra and she was an extraordinary Electra. Did you see it at Carnegie Hall? I actually not only saw it at Carnegie Hall, I spoke before that performance. And well, I was in that with her. With oh, Lauren Mazel, part yeah, Lauren Mazel conducted, and yes. Colleen and I and a bunch of other Ava actors. Martone on the opera yes. side, right? yeah, okay. And we read, <laughs> we we read uh, the words or something. Well, John, I'm sorry to confess that I so was dazzled by Colleen Dewhurst. I didn't remember. And well, you should have been. <laughs> but that was that was a great. I loved being there. Yeah. For Carnegie Hall for, through the years has hired me to speak before certain performances. And, wow. that was one. and then <laughs> so recently so we they did Electra fun. again, and I spoke again before that Electra that starred the wonderful Christine Gerke. Um, I do want to close the circle here. As listeners know, I always ask my guests to look at the Adagio catalog and provide a few works that inspire him or her. And you get as I would expect, gave wonderful ones. I asked you to pick a couple with Arthur Rubinstein and you picked the Brahms and Arachmaninoff, which are great and listeners can find it. Aaron Copeland conducted by Leonard Bernstein, this iconic American music from the gay Jewish guy from Brooklyn was interesting how he came to represent with his oh. music, all of Americana. How did he do that? He did it. He did it. And he did it for all time. No, he. And I have nothing much more intelligent to say about it than that. I steal from him when I write uh, movie music, especially for anything American or Western y, but so do all other composers too, because he, I don't know where he came up with it, it from Scotch Irish tunes, you know, but. He he found a language, an orchestral symphonic language for America that, uh, I, you know, I, as it I said, I have nothing intelligent to say about it, but it just, it goes right to the center of, he of this. He was a fine teacher. He was yeah. a great mentor. I met him when he was an old man. I mean, no, he was 80. Okay. And he died at 90. And um, and it was around the time of Children of a Lesser God, actually, in the same era. And I got to converse with him and he was very kind and genuinely interested in the development of young people and their interest in the arts. And um, he was wonderful to Leonard Bernstein who became his advocate at the New York Philharmonic. But 
it intrigued me, John, I don't know if you know this intersection, but I'm going to make it for you, that apart from the Brahms and the Rachmaninoff that we mentioned with Arthur Rubinstein, the other two were Copeland, a lot of his fine American works, and Benjamin Britten's opera, Peter Grimes, starring John Vickers. Now, do you know that Copeland and Britten live very close to one another in Brooklyn in the 19 late 1930s and, and just the beginning of World War II. <clears throat> because Britain lived in a building in Brooklyn Heights that was referred to as the February House. And many young aspiring writers, Carson McCullers lived with them for a while. It was owned by a wealthy woman named Gypsy Rose Lee, who was <laughs> the famous stripper who was the uh, subject of the Broadway show Gypsy. And um, she had very serious artistic intentions and she could underwrite and sponsor this house of creative people who were living together. And Benjamin Britten was openly gay back in the thirties and his partner was the tenor uh, Peter Pears who were British. And Copeland visited the house a few times and Britten and Copeland would talk about expressing national identity in music. Really? And because Britain was beginning to sketch this opera, Peter Grimes, uh, he was very taken with Copeland, I will call it benign instruction, that Copeland had a way of teaching you without feeling that he was beating your head with knowledge, but he just would inject it into your bloodstream and it would begin to bubble and, and twist inside your body. And Copeland did that about writing national character with Benjamin Britten at the February house. So um, wow. that's when Britain, that's amazing. Yeah. I'm so happy to. And it's a it. coincidence that you put those together. Yeah. And Britain and pairs were both pacifists. They did not want to fight in World War II, but they fully understood the threat of Nazism and of fascism. And they chose not to live in exile in Brooklyn, although they were very happy here in New York City, but to go back to the UK. And they sailed. What, uh, what year are we talking about? I would say 40, 41, maybe, maybe 42. But in the war, the war had already begun. And they sailed north past Canada and Iceland, and it was a very rough sea voyage. This was not a cruise ship. And they landed, I forget it was Belfast or Liverpool, but the northern part of the British Isles, and made their way by rail and by transport into England and decided in these next years that they would perform music all around the country, pairs in Britain, Britain on the piano, um, to help the national cause and national resolve that they would not touch a gun, but they would use their music for that. And they famously for years traveled all over the United Kingdom performing, often in bombing and so forth. And in the meantime, Britain was writing this character of Peter Grimes, drawn from um, poetry and a, and a story about a man who lived in the fens, the sort of marshy part of Eastern England in East Anglia. Great um, expectations. Yes, uh, a fisherman who, I don't even want to characterize him, but depending how you perceived him and how the artist playing him perceived himself, he was either a perpetrator, a victim, uh, an outcast in society, which could have been a bit of parable of Britain and Paris being openly gay when that was against the law, actually, in the United Kingdom. They were openly gay. They were openly a couple. Oh, I didn't know that. Openly, openly a couple. Whereas yeah, Copeland because it was, was illegal. It was. Yeah. Until 1969, John Gielgud was arrested in the 1950s. I know that. For yeah. some purported action. But... Um, here they were living openly and matter of factly about their being partners and lovers and so forth. And so there was a bit of that in Peter Pears interpretation. Uh, when you hear the recording of Peter Pears, it, it had a tragic nobility. It was not mental illness. It was not mania. It was not raging 
fire like an Othello or some of the great raging operatic characters. And this was the accepted version. There was a recorded version. Yes, with, yes, very famous version. With pairs uh, conducted by Britain until John Vickers came along. And John I, Vickers, I happened to see John Vickers yeah. play it. And that's, it was a great performance. In and Britain or New York or LA, where did you see in it? In LA at the yeah. Dorothy Chandler, yeah. Because I worked on, there was a Tyrone Guthrie production of the Met and I worked on it with Mr. Vickers. So I could call him John because he allowed me to, but somehow certain people, they're Mr. Vickers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I worked with Mr. Vickers a lot and he was a formidable, incredible presence. He was not easy, but I admired him and loved him. And he created a character where the notes on the page were the same and the words and the lyrics were the same that was so radically different from the Peter Pears version. Wow. That ever since every tenor who undertakes this role, and there have been many fine ones, including especially Anthony Dean Griffey, an American, very, very fine Peter Grimes, but either you are following the Britain pairs model or you are being compared unfavorably to the Vickers model. And it's very hard to do that. There was a British tenor, Philip Langridge, who did it more in the pairs way. How very, would you, very though, because since I never saw pairs, I've heard the recording several times. Um, I saw Vickers. How would you, um, characterize the two different uh, uh, approaches to that character? Well, first, let me say that Britain wrote many roles for pairs through the years. And it was based on the man he knew who was a, I mean, this in the best way, sensitive, fine artist. Albert Herring was one of them. Albert right? Herring and yeah. um, Captain Veer in Billy Budd yeah, yeah. and Aschenbach in Death in Venice and all of those characters. Right. But um, I would say that the Peter Pears, Peter Grimes was a victim of events and circumstances and of prejudice, not gay prejudice because we don't know or think that the character is gay or not gay. Part of what makes this work great is that it doesn't quite come down on one side or the other. Right. Does Peter love Ellen Orford, the school teacher who claims to understand him or does he use her for his own benefit? Does Ellen love him or do, is she lonely? There are all these variables that right. get played out when you stage it and you put two artists together. But Vicar, and I should say that the character of Peter Grimes is accused of killing or creating an accident in which a boy dies. And he dies in a fishing accident, basically. Um, we don't think, or it was probably neglect it's every stage director and performer would have to come to their own conclusion yeah. about that. Yeah, but because it isn't ever- uh, uh, It's not designated. specified. Right. And which is great, but therefore we can have many interpretations. Whereas I think getting back to my friend Ibsen again, there's the play Brand by Ibsen uh, and also the master builder are two characters who are spurned by society, but especially Brand. And to me, Brand is like the old story of Prometheus bound to go further back. And um, these are characters who have a torment and they exist through their torment rather than through life. And to me, Peter Grimes in the Vickers version existed through whatever his torment was. Uh -huh. And only Mr. Vickers would have understood within that, which is why no other person can recreate that performance. Um, there is a scene late in the opera in which the chorus of these judgmental, hypocritical down townspeople, they're prostitutes and and people trading in money and so forth, who are all not perfect characters either, but what they find in common is their judge, judgment of this outsider. And you hear the offstage chorus, Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, and he's being found guilty of a second death of a child, of a boy. And 
the way pairs would sing would be Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes. He was hearing them. Yeah. Them. Whereas Vickers, it was in his own head. It was rattling in his Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes. And the body would start to tense and shake because with every repetition of the name Peter Grimes, he would shake and rattle until he was so overwhelmed by it. And, and the character at the end, his only solution in his view, as written by Britain, was that he had to get on a boat and go out to sea and drown because he had no acceptance in the town. Was it because of who he was? Was it because who the others were? Same thing as Enemy of the People, now that I think about it, of this being misunderstood by the town that sort of the quote moral majority the QAnon <laughs> whatever you want <laughs> but it exists in, in art as it does in life and um, therefore when Vickers put out to sea it was very different from when Peter Pears put out to sea Peter Pears put out to sea in resignation um, because he had no other option with Vickers it was a suicide you didn't see him commit suicide, but you just knew that as he went off to sea, and then the beautiful music that Britain wrote of the the waves and the continuation, how the water and the waves continue no matter who or what is there. Uh, that's what was so powerful. And Colin Davis conducted that production oh. that you saw and mm -hmm. very famous interpreter, not just of Britain, but also Berlioz, a wonderful conductor. And it was just a singular performance by Mr. Vickers that um, if you saw it, you'd never forget it. Like Colleen yeah. Dewhurst, like yeah. that kind of, there are certain never artists. Leaves. And Mr. Rubenstein, like you in two roles that I saw you in. <laughs> and for which I'm greatly appreciative. And sir, two hours have gone by. <laughs> And it's such a pleasure talking to you. I must. I need to conclude, but it was really a pleasure to get to know you and learn about you and your approach to your art and also about your father. And I thank you. I thank Did I leave you. anything out? You have one more oh, story? Or... <laughs> we could clearly talk for a few more hours if they let us. <laughs> well, genuine thanks and be well. And I look thank forward to seeing you, you perform on Stay healthy. You too, sir. Thank you very much.